we on we definitely on on Shabbos. What for? For services, as I understand it, but we might be on with limited numbers, so I'm not sure yet what's going to be exactly. <coughs> Please uh, watch this space. At the moment, I've been told that we are on, but uh, you know, it's uh, you know, you'll have to speak exactly as we're the one that's making the decision, not me. Okay, right. Again, thank you very much, all of you guys, for joining me. It's you know, it's really nice to have this again together. So how are we going? Three, seven. And another four. So we got 11 people here at the share. That's brilliant. So I'm really excited to have all you guys with me. Again, Yossi, remind me again, what was the name you said? Yosef Ben Shlomo Zaman. Yosef Ben Shlomo Zaman. Tonight's share is being given in memory of Yosef Ben Shlomo Zaman. I'm so happy we're able to bring back this share and sushi or share and shawarma, whatever you want to call it. Here's a sushi to prove to you guys that the sushi did exist. Okay, let's get going. So, I'd like to start, and I'm gonna we're gonna start about the limits of pikuach nefesh because I'm, I'm gonna you know go through a bit of a, uh, I guess maybe a history or a bit of a uh, introduction as far as this is concerned. Where I'm 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 sort of gonna try to go with this and just to try to get my head around it because I I have been struggling with the question also, and basically I I want to start off by saying I'm not discussing hi good evening Harris or Deborah or if it's both of you I'm not discussing oh Sheila Morris is here I'm not discussing whether we are going for anybody who is doing something that goes against the law okay I'd like to make that you know clear from the outset. This year is not about a question of should we ignore the law of the land. Obviously, we should be. Can I, can I just? Uh, I'm going to mute. I'm not discussing Sorry about that. Okay, I'm not discussing whether we should uh, ignore the law of the land or not. That's not up for discussion. We are discussing an instance where we are not going to be ignoring the law of the land, meaning. If the medical professionals say it is not safe for us to get together, then we will not get together. And if the medical professionals say it is safe for us to get together with masks, then we will only get together with masks. The question is the following. So I remember early on, this is March, and I remember getting an email from the chief rabbi's office saying that all shuls must close. And in sort of working together with that email, our shul closed, all the other shuls, United Synagogue closed, and I was like, all right, well, our shul's closed, but the Haredi shul's aren't going to close. And, you know, I just wasn't sure what to do with myself, where to put myself. At the time, I think the whole corona thing was still so new, nobody really knew what to do with it. Nobody really knew how dangerous this is, how many people are going to die. Is this just something coming from China that's going to be a bit of a fad and it's going to go out? We're going to close the shul maybe by Pesach, we'll be back. Nobody thought that when we close the shul by, you know, a week or two before Pesach, that we wouldn't be back till well beyond Shavuot. Nobody thought that. It was a very, very strange time. I remember we closed the shul, and I went to speak to one of the Rabbonim in town, who shall remain nameless for the moment, but a very well-respected Rabb in town, and we had the following conversation. And he said to me, I'm very much struggling with closing my shul or not closing my shul. I'm not sure whether I should, I'm not sure whether I shouldn't, but I'm leaning on the side that maybe I should be closing my shuls. And if by closing our shuls we will save one individual, one person, then the whole thing will have been worthwhile. Then we should, then that's what we should do. And we need to close the shuls. And interestingly enough, that's what happened. A kol kore went out, there was a letter that went out from many of the Rabbonim, not all of them, but many of the Rabbonim in the Haredi sector, that shuls should close. What then ended up happening is very strange because basically either people started dominating in gardens, again, garden minyanim beyond the scope of tonight's discussion, I don't want to go back into that discussion, whether should or shouldn't be garden minyanim, whether they were legal or weren't legal, that's a discussion we've had already, and it's, it's not really what I want to discuss tonight. And again, I'm not discussing either whether it was against the law or not against the law, because we're discussing, with working with the law right now, okay? But suddenly... In May, you look around, and so many shuls are back to being open. And you're like, I'm not exactly sure how this happened, because legally the shuls are not meant to be open, but they're back to being open, um, and I don't know that happened. Then people started having garden minyanim, 
as we said, some people had God Minyanim in, in whatever garden they might be in. It was, uh, you know, it was a, a very strange time. Baruch Hashem, the weather was very, very mild. So for those people who did want to daven in a garden minion and did so in a safe manner, again, the garden minion only if it was done in a safe manner, not in an unsafe manner. The weather was really quite mild this summer and allowed for us to be able to daven in garden minyanim. And then suddenly we got to the minion with distancing. So basically we reopened up in July. And in July, it became that, yes, you can have a minion. However, you can only have a minion with certain rules and certain social distancing in place. And the shul, and in this instance, we, you know, we give a shout out over here, both to Ian Creek, to Paul Barrett, to Debbie Verber. In general, those are the three people that spend the most time on it. I also tried a little bit, but I'm not really very au fait with all the rules of the health and safety. So I can't really claim that I did anything other than trying to look around and not, not get in the way. But in the main, Paul, Debbie Verber, and maybe one or two other people on the Health and Safety Committee, they were able to put together rules and they were able to put together laws within the shul to make the shul a safe place or as safe as possible so that when we did open up in July, it was slowly a trickle. People started coming. Not that many people started coming. And then slowly but surely, as people got more and more comfortable, they started coming and then... People have been coming. And then we had a lockdown again in November where all the shows locked down and then we reopened up again and now we've gone back to a lockdown, okay? So we, we, I've worked my way through basically what's happened and what has happened now is the following. Within this new lockdown, yeah, thank you so much, Sheila, that's true. They have done an excellent job of making the shows safe and secure. You know, again, here, here, to, you know, I would I agree with that and, and, you know, as I said, hat off to all those people that really did that for our shoe. So now, they've, last week I was speaking to Rabbi Lewis of South Manchester, and Rabbi Lewis of South Manchester said to me, in South Manchester all the shuls are closed. And similarly, I got the same thing from Rabbi Amir Elitiv also, who said in South Manchester we've closed the shuls. Why is that? They, they took advice from a doctor who works in the emergency room in Withenshaw Hospital, who's a, a member, I think, of Rabbi Lewis's, I'm not sure whose member he is, but one of the members of one of the South Shuls, either in Hale or in Bowdoin, and he said, if you want to save lives, the way to save lives is by shutting down the Shuls, okay? And therefore, they shut it down, okay? Now, we are still open, and there was a discussion a, a night or two ago, and I think there's, there's been many, many discussions about COVID up until now, and, you know, what, what should we do? Or what is the halacha mandate for us to do? Do we say, you know, as we started off, maybe, you know, if one life throughout the entire time will be saved by us shutting down the shuls, then we as a shul have an obligation to shut down our shul because of Pikuach Nefesh. Or do we say, well, no, that, there's, there's no obligation to do that. That's not really the way it works in halacha. Halacha does have very strict guidelines of things, how they work and how they don't work. Hi, Simon. Nice to have you with us. So halacha has very strict guidelines of what is and what isn't. And you can't just say, listen, I believe that shul should close down because that's what I believe. Within halacha, there will be guidelines what is and what isn't. We cannot say then that halacha is mandated. If we then decide we want to do it anyway, fine. We could still come to the decision that we want to close our shuls. But don't blame halacha for it. Just, you know, we decide to close the shul because we decide to take the advice from whoever it is, for, from the medical experts. Okay? I will also say, I think I had this discussion uh, two weeks ago with Gary, and I think within this also, you have to realize, I think there are, there are two ways of looking at it. Both, I think, are sort of um, legitimate ways. They're, they are actually diametrically opposed, but I think they both have a legitimate point, and both of them, you need to figure out which one of the two, you know, which, where, where do you stand on this, uh, on this COVID discussion. So, uh, two weeks ago, I spoke about in shul about emotions versus logic, and I put forward the idea that my understanding was that logically speaking, if you have a place that's very safe, then you should be able to go in there. But emotionally speaking, if people are afraid, so then they won't want to go in. And then Gary said to me the opposite. He said, actually, you know, maybe it's the other way around. Logically speaking, that's Gary Hershkowitz, not, not Gary Freeman. Um, logically speaking, you know, this is the most dangerous thing that has happened to humanity in the last hundred years since the, the last uh, big pandemic that we had. 
And therefore, it doesn't make sense at all for anything to be open. And any of the things that are open are only open because people are becoming very emotional and saying, well, I still want to go to shul, I still want to feel I want to do this, I still want to feel I want to do that. But really, in reality, if we want to be really logically sound, we would just shut ourselves in and get rid of this virus once and for all, and maybe in a few months' time we'd come out, out of this hibernation. But that will be the most logical thing to do, okay? And I think that each one of these two sides has merit, and, you know, different people will be on different sides of this argument. Again, I'm not going into over here which side you're on, you know, and, and, and as I said, both sides have a merit to them. Both sides do make sense, but they're, they're coming at it from a different vantage point, from a different angle. So now the question is, I want to discuss with you about Bikuach Nefesh, what the obligations are in Halach as far as Bikuach Nefesh goes, and if there are any limitations in Halach as far as Bikuach Nefesh goes, and, you know, if there are those limitations, where do we draw the line? Okay, so far so good. Any questions, any comments you want to make in the meantime before I go to the next bit? If you do, please just unmute yourself and make the comment and then mute yourself again. Anyone? Right, okay, so we move on. Okay, so let's start with the source. So the source is, if you look in the Mishnah in Yuma, the Mishnah in the 8th parak of Yuma tells us, here we speak about the different things that you can do for Pikuach Nefesh. So first we talk about fasting on, on Shabbos and on Yom Tov. We say who has to fast and who doesn't have to fast. And then we speak about a pregnant woman and a pregnant woman suddenly gets a, you know, she gets a, um, when she suddenly has to desperately have something, she gets a, a craving. So then she's allowed to give, you're allowed to give her the food because that's considered dangerous and we need to feed her that craving. Similarly, if a person gets ill, and he has a craving, etc. You're allowed to give him, and you're even allowed to give him food that's not kosher in order to bring that down. Okay? And then he says, somebody, and then Ramas Yonchash continues, and he says, somebody who has a problem with his throat, you're allowed to use a certain kind of medication on Shabbos because it's a question of nefashus. It's a question of whether or not this is, this might be dangerous, might be something that is life threatening. The whole something nefashus, not as a Shabbos. Anything that is a question of whether it is nefashus or not, whether you, you, you will save somebody with it or not, pushes away the Shabbos. And then we bring it, we take it to one step further. Mishnah of Mapolis. The Mishnah is in Parakhes Mishnah Zayin, 8th chapter, 7th Mishnah in Yuma. You have a building that collapsed. And you don't know if there's an individual there or not. There could be somebody underneath there. There could be nobody there. He could be alive. He could be dead. He could be Jewish. He could be not Jewish. You don't know who is down there. So the halacha is, even though it is Shabbos, and you wouldn't be allowed to normally undo this on Shabbos, you wouldn't be allowed to go through the rubble on Shabbos, the halacha is, you're allowed to start digging there to find the individual and to try to get him out, because there's a question, now, you don't know the guy is alive or dead, because there's a question over here, you just, you go in over there. Even if you were to say, well, what are the chances, look at that, a whole house fell on this guy. What are the chances the guy is still going to be alive? We don't say that. You know, there have been many times where people have survived crazy, terrible earthquakes, where entire buildings have fallen on them, and they've been stuck somewhere underneath all this rubble for a week or maybe longer than that, and still we were able to pull people out alive. And therefore, since there, might, there is even an infinitesimal chance that this person is still alive, you just undo everything, you go for it. The Allah then says, Mitzvah if you find him alive, Mevachanolov, you continue looking. But if he's dead, Yanichu, once you've gone in there, you've gone through the whole rubble, or you find, you knew there was an individual in there, and you find the person, you can tell he is dead. You know, how you can tell he is dead, that's the discussion in the Gemara. This is actually where the entire discussion in the Halakha comes up. At what point a person is dead? Do we say secession of breathing or secession of heartbeat? And then the whole question of brain death versus, um, versus death by respiration, that comes up over here in this Gemara. So, if you find the guy alive, you can continue going. If you find the guy dead, then you have to leave him there. After Shabbos, you can then dig him out, and after Shabbos, you give him his proper burial. And the reason the Gemara over there brings is because when you have pikuach nefesh, the halacha is pikuach nefesh. Anything that's a question of whether you are going to be able to save something or not save someone, you have to save the individual, and even if it's Shabbos, and even if you do anything. More than that, the Gemara also says that 
The Gemara says that the, the Torah tells us that the mitzvahs have been given for us to live with them, not for us to die with them. And therefore, unless you have the three cardinal sins, which are immorality or murder or idol worship, pikuach nefesh can get rid of of any of those things. So if you have a mitzvah to do, let's say, as we mentioned before, you have to eat kosher. However, there's also an issue <coughs> that whilst you have to eat kosher, there's somebody who's very ill and he needs to take a medication and this medication is life-threatening and he needs to have something that's straight. So is he allowed, is he not allowed to have it? In many instances, by the way, the medication will not have anything in it that will, uh, you know, that will be considered properly trait, even if it has parts of pig or whatever in it, oftentimes it's been so genetically modified, it's been so chemically modified that it's not considered pig anymore, it might be mutter anyway. But even without that, if it's a dangerous situation, you're allowed to have this tray for food because it's going to save someone's life and we're, we're in the business of saving people's lives, we're not in the business of killing people for our religion. Okay, that's the first point that we would make. However, there seems to be a limitation within this as well. And so here the limitation is brought in Shulchan Aruch and in the following halacha. The Shulchan Aruch speaks about what's known as tzedah. Tzedah is hunting. And the Shulchan Aruch discusses in which instances are you allowed to hunt animals and which instances you're not allowed to hunt animals. And beyond hunting animals is another halacha that comes up, which is killing animals. Are you allowed to kill animals on Shabbos? So hunting animals on Shabbos is forbidden. Midah oiraisa, it's a Torah prohibition of hunting on Shabbos. Killing an animal is a Torah prohibition of killing an animal on Shabbos. So therefore, both of these things are considered forbidden on Shabbos. Now, what happens if you're dealing with a dangerous animal? So you might say, you're sitting over there in your room, and you know suddenly a scorpion walks into the room, and you see that scorpion, you say, well, that thing is extremely dangerous. But it's Shabbos, I cannot touch it. And therefore you just leave it there. That's a real danger. You don't just leave a scorpion there. You'd better off either killing the thing or at least getting it out of the room or maybe trapping it. Do something to it, but don't just leave it there. So the halacha says, if you have an animal, if you have a, some kind of creepy crawler that would bite and kill, definitely you're allowed to kill those on Shabbos. There's no question that you're allowed to kill those animals on Shabbos because they are dangerous. And you don't have to wait to be in acute danger from these animals. You're allowed to get rid of them even beforehand. And even though they are not running after you, you're still allowed to kill them. Right? However, if you have snakes or scorpions in a place where snakes would not come anywhere near human beings, where they, you know, where, you know, you know that it's not dangerous, you're not in any, you know, if it's a place where they normally, you know, they, they are dangerous and they will attack human beings, so then you got to do what you got to do. If they in general do not attack human beings, so then it will depend. If they are running after you, then you can kill them, but if they're not running after you, then you're not allowed to kill them. That's what the, the halacha says, and, but if you're walking around and you step on them, there's no issue, because that, you know, that, that we still allow you to do. Again, how will you know or won't you know that this animal is out to kill you or not? That's a good question. I don't know, but that's what Allah says that we, you know, we're going to go with that for now. Okay, so the Magen Avram, which is one of the commentaries on the, uh, on the Shulchan Aruch, one of the main commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, says the following. He says, what about a spider? So if you have a spider, or I don't know if many of you have heard this. I've heard this a few times from people, you know, when you have wasps flying around in the sukkah, People trap the wasps or they kill the wasps and say, because these wasps are deadly to young children. Now, I don't know, I've never, my kids have been bitten by wasps, Baruch Hashem, you know, in general, all that happens is that they cry and then you put on some uh, Benadryl or you put on some kind of, a, you know, um, antihistamine and the swelling goes down. And in general, like, I, I don't like it when my kids get bitten by, by bees or by wasps. But, you know, I don't think they've ever been in any mortal danger from being bitten by a, by a wasp or by a bee. Some people take that very seriously. You have to be very careful that, you know, there, there's no carte blanche over here that you can just go and you can kill them. So the Mughan Avram speaks about killing spiders. He says, what about spiders? Those people that say, hey, there's a spider over here. Let's kill the spider. Okay? He says, you're not allowed to kill spiders. Who gives you the permission to kill a spider on Shabbos? A spider on Shabbos is, is you know, it's a live human, it's a live animal. Killing it on Shabbos is a prohibition of killing an animal on Shabbos so that you can't do it. And this spider is not doing anything to you. And my daughters, 
as soon as a spider comes into the room, they go start screaming. And I say, well, it's a spider. You're, you're like 50 to 100 times its size. It's not poisonous. Just chill out. If you leave it alone, it will leave you alone. It's not like a bee that goes flying. Just move away. If it's in this corner, just move to the other corner. You have to go with sugar. Ah, spiders. All right, calm down. So he says, if you have a spider, it, you're not allowed to kill it because it's not, you know, it's not really damaging you. Even, even if you're worried maybe it'll fall into your food, he says that's not going to happen. And you, you know, and you could cover up your food. And even if you have a one in a thousand chance maybe that it is a danger, still we, we wouldn't allow you to kill a spider for that, you know, for that reason, and therefore we shouldn't allow people to kill spiders. So here, the Mogan Avram seems to be telling us that there's a limitation to the idea of, of, um, of Pikuach Nefesh. Even though he's saying, well, look, you have spiders over here, and even though it might be possible, theoretically, that this spider would be dangerous, and that you would, that with this spider you wouldn't be allowed to, um, that this spider could maybe be poisonous or something could happen, nevertheless, we don't allow you to kill the spider, and even if it's a chance, one in a thousand, tough. You, do, you cannot do anything for, about it. And the question becomes, why not? Why aren't you allowed to kill the spider? If we say Pikuach Nefesh allows you to kill A, allows you to do anything in order to keep someone alive, so this is order, there's also something to keep someone alive. So what's the difference between one and the other? And that's the question that a, uh, you know, the contemporary poet, Rav Moshe Sternbuch, asked the following question. And Rav Moshe Sternbuch says is the following. He says there is a difference between a clear and present danger or a hypothetical danger. Okay? So that where there is a clear and present danger, right? So then you say, you know what? Pikuach nefesh. So you're going to say, I have over here an individual. He's lying on his deathbed. No, not now. Sorry, just got a phone call. You have over here... A, uh, you have over here an individual that's lying on his deathbed. He's in clear and present danger. And you ask the doctors, and the doctor says, well, maybe we could give him one more injection, but the chances of that injection doing anything is one in a thousand. Should we give him the injection? Absolutely yes. Yes, you do whatever you can to make sure that you keep this guy alive. You have somebody lying underneath the rubble, and you're not sure whether or not this individual is alive or not, even if the chances are a thousand to one, ten thousand to one, a hundred thousand to one, that the guy is alive, you still keep going. You don't say, well, what are the chances that he's still alive? Let's just leave him there. We'll wait till after Shabbos. No, you don't wait till after Shabbos. You undo it as soon as you can. You know, my wife told me that she has, a, she has family where there's somebody within the family that had a that had a suspected stroke and they waited until after Havdallah to call, you know, to call the ambulance. And this individual has long-lasting damage and they shouldn't have done that. Whether it was a question or not, if this woman had a stroke, you should have picked up the phone on the spot and called the ambulance and gone to the hospital ASAP. Why? There's a clear and present danger here. When there's a clear and present danger, we don't look at the chances. We say clear and present danger is clear and present danger. You do whatever you can to save anybody. And you can trample over Shabbos, you can trample over kosher, you can trample over everything other than idol worship and murder and, and immorality. However, says Ramosha Shtermuch, there's a difference between a clear and present danger and a potential danger. When you have the case of the spider, you're dealing with a potential danger. Yes, Potentially, you could have a spider over there that's dangerous. But what are the chances? One in a thousand? He says, that's not good enough chance for you to say that I'm, I'm going to be Mechalel Shabbos now, I'm going to desecrate the Shabbos because maybe this is a spider that's a poisonous spider. Now, if you have a poisonous spider, yeah, you can Mechalel Shabbos. But if you have a spider and you don't know whether it's poisonous or not, and you don't know whether it got anywhere near your drink or not, and you don't know whether anything dangerous has happened or not, so what are you going to say? You say, yeah, but Pikuach Nefesh tells me I have to kill the spider. No, Pikuach Nefesh doesn't have to kill the spider. Don't drink the drink. Nobody says you have to kill this animal. You don't know that it is or it isn't a danger. And when there's no clear and present danger, there's no obligation of Pikuach Nefesh. And this is 
sort of the first bit that I'd like to say to come at, I'll start with this and then we'll come back to the other point. This is maybe the first point, and again, this can be debated. I'm sure there'll be people that will debate this. Whether today, if you are in a place that has all the security measures in place that it needs to have, so you have the social distancing and you have the masks and you have all the signposts and you have the uh, hand sanitizer and everybody's keeping away from each other. When you have everything in place, is it still a clear and present danger? So some would say, yes, it's still a clear and present danger. Fine. If you believe that to be a clear and present danger, no problem. Then, you know, then I, then I, I fully agree with you. If that's a clear and present danger, then you go home, then that's Bikuach Nefesh and, and you leave it. But if you don't believe that to be a clear and present danger, and again, as I said, there are two schools of thought here. So some people will say, yes, this is a clear and present danger. And some people will say, no, and both sides have merit. But if you don't believe that to be a clear and present danger, it's just a potential for danger. There the halacha doesn't say any time potentially something's going to happen that maybe might be dangerous, you always have to be careful. That's not what the halacha says. That's not what the halacha B'Kuach Nefesh tells us. It tells us where there's clear and present danger, you can push away any halacha you want to. When there's a potential for danger, then you look at it percentage-wise. If the potential for danger is very high, you've got to be careful. If there's a very infinitesimal percentage for danger, then you don't have to be careful. That's point number one. And point number two, uh, you know, somebody mentioned this. I, I, I asked him for a source, and he sent me his sources, but I didn't see it there within his sources. He actually mentioned that a lot of things that are considered within the range of the normal are permissible in halacha, even if they carry maybe an element of danger to it. So, for example, childbirth in halacha is considered something dangerous. When a woman goes to childbirth, she's considered in life-threatening danger, and therefore on Shabbos, anything that needs to be done for a woman who's in, who's in labor can be done. You need to take a car to the hospital. We've done it on two occasions. We've taken a car to the hospital for our two children. One of them, we went on Shabbos and was born on Matzah Shabbos. One of them, we went Friday night and was born Friday night. Twice, I went in the car to the hospital on Shabbos. My wife gave birth on Shabbos. Once I actually had to walk home from St. Mary's at 4 o'clock in the morning on a Friday night. That was an interesting occasion. That was a very interesting experience to walk through town with a whole bunch of drunkards at 5 o'clock in the morning. But be that as it may, I had no permission to take a taxi back. I was allowed to take the taxi there with my wife because my wife was in the car and she was in clear and present danger. I wasn't in clear and present danger, so I walked. Yeah? By the way, that, that is probably not the case for a woman. If you have a woman who's on her own in hospital and she needs to, and she's discharged from hospital in the middle of the night on a, uh, you know, on a Friday night and she's got to walk home from St. Mary's back to Seoul, she should get a taxi. That's dangerous. So that did happen to my wife when she was in, my wife went with my father-in-law to Hope Hospital and then they kicked them out of the hospital and they took a taxi back. Because for them to walk home, for a woman to walk home through Salford at 3 o'clock in the morning is extremely dangerous. But for me as a man to walk through, you know, Withington Park and that whole area walked through town. It was fine. I wore a hat. I wore a coat over myself. Nobody could see that I was wearing my Shabbos clothes. I wore trainers. That's it. You just walked. Ignore everybody else. It wasn't dangerous. I walked straight through. But how is a woman allowed to have a baby? How is any woman allowed to become pregnant? What about Pikuach Nefesh? We should say every woman should have herself sterilized because it's Pikuach Nefesh for her to put herself into a situation where she's going to have a baby. The answer to that question is, within the realms of what's considered normal, that is acceptable. And therefore, that's okay. That is within the realm of what's natural. So yes, there's Bikuach Nefesh, and therefore there is no, by the way, there is no specific obligation for any woman to have a child. The obligation to have a child is on the man, and if he finds a willing woman, great, and if he doesn't, then tough luck, he's not going to be able to have any kids. But you don't know woman, we cannot say to a woman, you have a Torah obligation to have a child, because a woman says, that's dangerous for me. Torah says, yeah, we appreciate that. We're not forcing you to put yourself in a dangerous situation. So a woman's not obligated, but if she wants to, it's not forbidden. You want to cross the road. I tell you what, crossing the road can be dangerous, especially in certain areas. Nevertheless, we're still allowed to cross the road. You want to travel? You're going to travel. Travel has danger with it. You want to take a boat, you come off the boat, you're going to have to say hagomel. You're going to have to go to shul, you're going to have to make a bracha to say, thank you, Hashem, for keeping me alive throughout this dangerous period. So who says you're allowed to take a boat? He says it's a normal mode of travel, you have to do it. You take a plane, 
You're allowed to do it. Why? After you finish, you're going to have to say, I go up by the fact that you took a plane. That's part of normal life. So normal life is not forbidden. And here again comes to the same question as we said before. Number one, as we mentioned in the beginning, potential danger. Number two, living normal life. Those are the two things within halacha that even though we say pikuach nefesh is of utmost importance, and it is of utmost importance. Nobody should come away from the shir saying that the Torah doesn't consider pikuach nefesh of utmost importance. It is above everything else. But there are definitions within what is considered pikuach nefesh and what is not. And what is permissible with Kuach Nefesh and what's not permissible with Kuach Nefesh. And so I'll finish really with an idea that I said around Rosh Hashanah time. And I think to me this is the very important idea. So when people say about closing shuls, not closing shuls, we should close, we shouldn't close. So again, there are two sides to this. One is, halachically speaking, are you obligated to close the shul? I think it's quite clear that halachically speaking, for reasons of Kuach Nefesh, you are not obligated to close the shul. If the membership and if the president or whoever else it is feels they nevertheless they want to close the shul because that is how they feel most comfortable, okay, look, again, there's what to be discussed over there. But the question then becomes, is that because of halachic reasons or other reasons? That, you know, that can be discussed. But I think what, you know, what, what did disturb me, and I, I, I mentioned this, I mentioned this a few times to people, there was, my wife gave a shear before Rosh Hashanah. She gave that cheer in the Hilton suite with social distancing and masks and with a, uh, with a, um, a plastic in front of her. So she was behind a screen. And we got a phone call from somebody within the shul. And this lady within the shul called me up and said, Rabbi, I'm, you know, I'm really worried that you're putting on the shear. And I said, well, why are you worried? And this lady says, well, isn't it dangerous? I said, well, which bit of it is dangerous? You know, it's all legal. We're allowed to hold educational events. It's going to be in the Hilton Suite. Everybody's coming in one way, coming out the other way. Everybody's sterilizing, washing their hands on the way in. Everybody's sitting two meters apart. Everybody's going to be wearing masks. My wife's going to be standing behind the screen. In which way is that, you know, is that dangerous? And the lady says to me, all right, I hear you, but I just feel, you know, isn't this an unnecessary risk? Aren't you taking an unnecessary risk over here? And I said, look, I... You don't want to come, you don't have to come. It's going to be available on Zoom as well. So you come, you can watch it on Zoom. You don't have to come. But for the ladies who want to come, why not? Why, let, why not let those women that feel that this is okay, let them come and, and, you know, and join the shear? And, you know, that's what happened. So we had eight women who came in person, and we had about 25 who came by Zoom. Which goes to show you, by the way, a lot more people felt comfortable coming on Zoom than felt comfortable coming in person. And that's fine, right? But there were some people that felt they would rather come in person, and they would rather be there in person, together with my wife, going through the shear, and that's also a fine. And I remember at the time, you know, having the discussion, and then I said this in a sermon, and, and this is really the crux of it, is that, you know, there are people that take risks. Lots of people take risks, as far as a lot of things that they do. You know, if you want it to be safe as safe can be, there are people in our shul I spoke to this week who told me they've not been out since March. They don't go to shops. They don't go anywhere. They've been home since March. You know, and, and I take my hand off to them because I don't know that I could manage to be home since March. Okay, they don't have little children. It's a little bit different in their instance, so it, it becomes a little bit more possible. But still, the bottom line is, it's extremely difficult for anybody to be home for nine months on the trot. It's hard for your mental health. It's hard for your physical health. It's just very, very hard. And they just basically walk around the garden if they want to get some fresh air. And they stay home. And they stay home the whole time. And these are people that take zero risks. And you say, well, all right. You're a person of zero risks. You're a person that says, I'm not willing to risk anything. I take my hat off to you. But then there are the other people. And they're the people that say, you know what? I need to go to the shops. I'm going to go to Tesco because I want to pick my own grapes. And I want to pick my own apples. You have to pick your own apples. You have to pick your own grapes. You can get Tesco.com to deliver it to you. Asda, Morrison, they all do a good job. Waitrose, if you really want to go all the way. You know, who cares? You want to get from Kosher Savers? Call Kosher Savers. You want to get from Havers? You get from Havers. They all have delivery services, and they all have fruit and veg, and they have meat, and they have all the kosher things that you need, and they even have cleaning products. You don't need to leave the house. But you decide to leave the house. And you need a haircut, you go and get yourself a haircut. And you need to go to the gym, you'll go to the gym. And suddenly when it comes to shul, 
there's this uproar where people say, Rabbi, it's really dangerous. Do you know how many people I spoke to before Rosh Hashanah that told me how dangerous it was, the shul? And I thought to myself, but these are people that go everywhere. These are people that, these aren't people that are staying home. These are people that are going to work and they're going to shops and they're going to gyms and they're going to hairdressers and they're going to hang out with their friends. And suddenly when I call them up and I say, you're coming to shul for Rosh Hashanah, they say to me, Rabbi, shul's a really dangerous place. And the issue with that is, basically coming back to the comment that the lady made to me, is not so much about risk, because these people are willing to take risks. And if you're willing to take a risk, so take a risk. If you're not willing to take any risks, fine. That's one category. You take no risks whatsoever, understood. But those that do take risks, what they're basically saying is, I am going to now quantify, and I'm going to grade what's a risk that's worth my while taking, and what's a risk that's not worth my while taking. And I have decided that choosing my own apples in Tesco is a risk that I'm willing to take. And I must tell you, I've been to Tesco, and I've been to a lot of the other shops, and if anybody tells you that people stay two meters apart from each other in any of these shops, it's just not true. That's not the fact, that's not the reality. The reality is, People are not keeping the rules the way they're supposed to, even in shops where they're supposed to. There are lines on the floors, and people are supposed to keep away from each other, and people are supposed to wear their masks properly. Lots of people don't wear their masks all the way over the nose, they wear them halfway down their mouth. And lots of people are standing next to you, and people come into your space, and then, yo, can I just get this? Can I just get that? You know what I'm talking about. And nobody walks around with gloves anymore. I remember we used to have gloves in May. I was still shopping with gloves. Anybody here still, still shop with gloves? No. But somebody else might have touched the stuff that you're touching. All right, big deal. So you went and you chose your apples and you went to do all these things. And then when it comes to shuls, suddenly people stand up and say, Rabbi, this is really dangerous. So it's not about the risk anymore. There it becomes about necessary and unnecessary. And that's really where you need to ask yourself the question, where do I stand on this entire conversation? Now, if I take zero risk, I take zero risk, then I don't want to take any risks in anything, and sure is included in that. But if I do accept that I'm taking risks in my life, and I go to work, and I go do all the other things that I mentioned to you before, why is Shul not part of that? Why can't Shul become a part of that thing that we are discussing? Why is shul the only place where suddenly everybody has to turn around and say, pikuach nefesh, and we have to shut down? You know, and so, whilst the individual in South Manchester, the doctor from the ER who says, you know, if you want to save lives, you close it, he might be right, potentially. But I've actually asked around, and there's not been one instance of a COVID patient that's been able to link his COVID to any of the United Synagogue shuls around the country. That cannot be said for many of the Heimish shuls. I'm sure people got COVID in many of the Heimish shuls. And again, I wasn't talking about people who are not doing things by the law. I said that from the outset. But I'm talking now within the law. Should we still be desperate to close our shuls? I don't think so. You know, Pikuach Nefesh does not mandate that we have to close the shuls. Those people that feel it is a risk, they can stay home. And that's fine. If you feel it's a risk, stay home. It's a risk. But if you're willing to take risks, I don't think shul is any more of a risk than any other place. Our shul has done a fantastic job of making it a really, really safe place. And I guess part of this year would also be sort of to, uh, to appeal to a lot of the people that are here. I know some of the people here come to Minion almost every day or every day, but some of the people don't come as often. You know, if some of the younger people come to shul, then we can ask some of the older people to stay home who are more at risk. Maybe if we weren't so strapped for a minion, maybe I would say to some of the 70-year-olds, you know what, please don't come. We have enough people for a minion. But at the moment, I don't have that many people that are expendable at the minion. We have 12 people, and some of them have to leave early, and sometimes we're left with only 10, and four of them are Kanish There are four people that are saying Kanish now. It'd be really useful to have extra young people that be willing to come, even once a week for Shachwis, or once a week for Marit. That's all you need. But to say that here... I have to suddenly, the halacha mandates that I cannot come to shul because of Guach Nefesh. I just don't think that that's, that's not intellectually honest, and that's not halachically honest either. So that's the idea that I wanted to share with you tonight. Any questions, comments anybody would like to make, please, you know, uh, unmute yourself and come forward. I have, a, I have a quick question, just on the concept of Guach Nefesh. You do talk about risk and associated with 
you know, at the end of the day, it's a person's choice whether they go to Tesco, whether they go, whether they go to Shul. Yes. But in terms of, in terms of the more oh. crazy shuls, shuls and the outlook of the Koch Nefesh from that element, yes. is there any justification or is it, well, you know, like, we all know what's going on, let's, we don't, you know, people can turn a blind eye and people oh. don't have to go, but this is not just a case of, Let's make a minion. There's two two hundred people at Kiddush on Shabbos. Okay, so I, I, you know what? I think there are a few things to be said over here. So that, that you know, I, I, again, as I said, I didn't want to go into discussing things that go against the law, but I want to. I just want to pick up on the points that you're mentioning. Let me just see where you are. There you are, I'm Michael. Asking, I'm asking the question just from a pikuach nefesh. Uh, so I would say the following. You know, when people said to me in May or in June when they had their shuls open. We have to have shuls open. People don't realize how much of a part of us it is and how important it is, etc., etc. You know, we can sort of get into the discussion where they're right, where they're wrong, how important is it. Probably they were wrong because it went against the law, but okay, we can have a discussion. But where people start having kiddushin, or people start having weddings, or people start having shalom zahars, where that, you cannot tell me that's part of my identity. You can tell me it's part of my identity that I have to daven three times a day. But it's not part of your identity that you have to have a whiskey with somebody else in the Shalom Zachar. And it's not part of the other person's identity that because he had a baby, he has to try and contaminate everybody by offering everybody whiskey without any masks. That's not part. So I would say, first of all, when you speak about Kiddushim or things like that, I would, you know, I don't know that there is any real justification for it. Okay, that's the first thing that I would say. Right? When it comes to davening, some people like to justify it. Again, I'm not justifying. I'm not saying that they're right in what they do. I'm just going to tell you what people will say. And I'm not, this is, this is just to give over the other side, not to say that this is anything that I agree with. That people have told me the following. Number one, they've said that uh, the amount of deaths in the community. It, somebody from the Chavar Kedisha told me yesterday or two days ago that he has seen the, the statistics. For the amount of deaths. Oh, come on. He has seen the statistics for the amount of deaths this year versus the statistics for the amount of deaths last year within the community. So this is in the, um, in the general community. He's part of the Chavar Kedisha of the Bezdin. And he said, yes, it was slightly higher, but it was within the variance of the normal. So the normal, within the normal year, it's somewhere between 80 and 120. Last year was 100. This year was 120. But he says we've had other years where it's been 120 where we haven't had COVID. So it's not been, you know, he says... The idea that there's been this disproportionate amount of deaths within the community, he says, is not correct. Also, again, I'm mentioning only something that, that somebody else said. I'm not now saying that it is correct. I'm just mentioning what was said to me. Also, the fellow said that, you know, a lot of people that have been put down as COVID deaths are not really COVID deaths. So he said this individual that got buried yesterday, he said he had cancer. He was very, very ill. And it was a question of days before he would die. And then the guy was on a COVID ward and either he got COVID or he didn't get COVID, but he was on a COVID ward. And they wrote on his death certificate COVID. But he says, but I look at the guy and I know the guy had a million and one things wrong with him. He didn't die of COVID. He died of everything else. COVID killed him. Right? COVID was a final step within the process, but he didn't die of COVID. And he said there are many, many people like that. He's part of the Chavar Kedisha, he's part of the Mesaskim. He says, I know a lot of people that didn't really, their main issue wasn't COVID. And so that he says some of the COVID deaths and some of the, you know, some of the danger of this is being sort of totally blown out of proportion. The other point that they make, again, I'm say, again, I'm making these points because I just want to mention the other side, not because I agree with them, but I have to, I just, you know, because you asked the question, I'm just saying it. If they say, you look at the Frum community and they, you know, you would expect there to be some kind of serious graveyard of COVID deaths within the, within the Frum community. And there isn't. There's no evidence to show that there have been any more deaths within the Frum community than there have been anywhere else within the UK. And so there they say, so, you know, we're all hiding behind this mask, you know, pardon the pun, and we're all carrying and we're all doing all these things, etc., etc. And there's nothing to it. The reality is very different than for what we're being sold. Now, does that mean they're allowed to break the law? No. And does that mean, I mean, it, I still think, so what's the big deal? So wear a mask. What's the big deal? Right? We've been wearing masks for six months during davening. It's not the end of the world. I wore Rosh Hashanah and I wore Yom Kippur. Yes. Do I prefer davening without a mask? Of course I prefer davening. We all prefer davening without a mask. 
But is it enough of a deal to say that I'm just going to ignore the law of the land entirely and just because it suits me, I don't want to wear a mask? I don't think so. So I, I, I'm just giving you some of the things that you'll hear from the other side. Again, as I said, it's not because I agree with it, because I don't, but this seems to be what, what is going on within the community, and this seems to be why that part of the community is not listening. Again, as I said, not to justify it, but just to tell you some of the things that I've heard from the other side. Gary, yeah. Can I, yeah, can I just come in? I just wanted to just uh, see if you want to clarify something on the co-op nefesh. Are you saying that with the co-op nefesh, it's got to be like person to a particular individual or a case at that time, rather than generally speaking? So it's got to be, it's got to be refer in halacha. It's got to, it's got to refer to a specific person at a specific time. Yeah, but you can refer to yourself even as a specific thing. So you say, I am vulnerable, so for, my, so for me, it is pikuach nefesh to go out. But to say that it's a dangerous situation outside and therefore everybody is in a situation of pikuach nefesh, that's, you know, that in halacha, the halacha doesn't really agree with that, specifically to say everybody's in pikuach nefesh. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, any other questions? Does anybody else want to come in? Hi, Rich. About the Israeli community, I just, you perhaps might be able to answer this more than more than most others on this call. What is the reason that I and I, I, I hear you, you've said that it's not it's not what you agree with, but you've given the arguments that you've heard from from some people in that community. Yeah. But what what is it what is it that's driving them to so so? Be so relaxed about the rules, just not to care. What? Not, not only, okay, so it's not going to cause wear a mask, so you don't want to not to wear a mask. Not only to go to the next level, we'll, we, we, we like to have a condition, so we'll definitely just have a condition. Like, why, why do they have to, to do everything that is, is, is so far from keeping the rules? Every, you know, plenty of people are breaking the rules and plenty of people will do something, but but they, they effectively have just had no regard for the rules whatsoever in, in, okay. in many cases. Yeah, I hear you. So I, I think, again, this is, I'm just surmising. I've, nobody's told me this, and I'm just surmising again, as I, I said before, and I'm not taking this side. I'm just trying to maybe answer the question. Um, I think with all of us, it's sort of a question of you push the boundaries. We all like to push the boundaries. Everybody pushes the boundaries in a certain way, you know, whether it is in business, so you want to see, you know, want to make a little bit more money, you want to push it a little bit this way, I want to do it that way. Whether it is in our own lives, if you're allowed A, maybe I can be allowed B. You know, we all, we have a certain amount of pushing the boundaries. And I think basically what's happened is, over the past six months, there's been a little bit of pushing of the boundaries and a little bit more of the pushing of the boundaries and a little bit more of the pushing of the boundaries. And every time they've pushed the boundaries slightly, nothing's happened. There's not been any sort of like, um, sort of fallout from it. And I think as they push the boundaries more and more and there's no fallout from it, at one point or another they start to say to themselves, okay, you know what, push it further, push it further. Again, that's not to say that that's, you know, that that's correct. I just think that that's more or less how it's happened. So we started with Minyanim in the gardens. Then we started with Yanim in one garden. Then we said, well, if we're dominating together in one garden, why not we dominate inside? And if we dominate inside, why do we need to have a mask? And as they do more and more things and there's no huge fallout from it, they say, well, if I can dab them together and can dab them together with a mask, maybe we can have a bit of a l'chaim. When we have a l'chaim and nothing happens, maybe we'll put a bit of cake. We have a cake, we'll make a full-blown kiddush, make a kiddush, we might as well make a wedding. Making a wedding, making a shalom's off. You know, it's, I, I, that's what I think. Again, it's, it's only, it's my theory that this is how it's happened. Why it is in reality, I have no idea. And, um, you know, it's, I don't know. The honest truth is, is I don't know, but this is my theory. Any other questions? Any other comments? Yeah, I just would like to just wrap up just on what you were saying in terms of the statistics. Yeah. Um, as you say, obviously a lot of people have died and their underlying health, and that is basically one of the arguments. Again, I'm not justifying that, justifying anything else that's going on. But I'll give you an example. When my wife gave birth two weeks ago. Yes. So, but any of the whatever. And when it came to going into labor, no questions asked. The, the, at the end of the day, the, the, wife, the, the women were in the, in, the, in the ward there with their partners, with the babies. And at the end of the eight hours, she was, she was in and out 
Ross and Gold same same day. They right. said, oh, Mrs. Gatsa, by the way, we'll give you a COVID test. Right. So it's like, well, hold on one second. Either the world's gone mad, COVID doesn't exist, Crime Soul Hospital is completely clueless, yes. or something's not working somewhere because then if my wife, God forbid, does have COVID, then everybody's got COVID. We're in the whole ward. In the whole ward, yeah. And but the, why, the, why was the ward so lax about COVID? It's very strange the way you're saying that. Cross, again, Really? And I was, I was amazed because the entire process of her going through a pregnancy, obviously I wasn't allowed to go, I had no partners, etc. Mm -hmm. When it came to giving birth, then again, as you say, either COVID doesn't exist and the world's gone mad, or obviously when a, when a woman's in labor, then that's the priority and, and COVID is secondary. But I think six months ago, women had to give birth on their own. I know people that told me they had to, I know people that said to me that, you know, giving birth recently was the hardest thing they had to do because always they were able to go to the, the hospital with their husbands. And for the last baby that they had six months ago, they had to go on their own. Their husband wasn't allowed in. Right. Now, now nothing. Now anybody can walk in, no questions asked. Yeah, again, that's not right. Correct. You know, especially from the NHS position. You talk about the Haredi community, the, the hospital, which is the, the place where people are obviously being poor and dying and... and and are the savior of, of people who are dying with COVID are not able to stick to the rules either. So what I would say is, I mean, you seem quite relaxed about it, but I know a lot of people that would actually pick up the phone to PALS, to the patient advice liaison, and they would say to them, hey, listen, guys, this is not okay. You know, you just let me in without checking my temperature. You didn't check when I had COVID. Everybody's rummaging around and, you know, and making believe like it's a party they're over they're here. Saying, the, mid the midwives did, did all wear masks, and I wore masks the entire time. Shocked at the end of the, uh, just before she was leaving, oh, Mrs. Gasser, let's just give you a COVID test. I said, Well, why well, if they said if she's positive, we'll let you know. It's like, What do you mean? Then the entire world is positive, and all the babies, and everybody else. Yeah, you know, bit strange. As it is very strange. Okay, I, I don't know. Again, you know, life, uh, <laughs> I find life stranger than fiction, as we often say that. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Well, no, so the woman is one thing, but they shouldn't have let you in, for example, without even checking, because you don't need to be there. Because anybody could come in, whatever. Okay, so then, again, so that's, I mean, okay, it's a good question. I don't know. The, again, I don't know why Crumpsell did or didn't behave like that. I just find it very, very strange. But, uh, you know, yeah. Correct. Very strange. If you, at least if you're going to take a COVID test, then do it, you know, or whatever. I don't think there wasn't really time, but the fact that they came at the end of the day, when she'd been there eight hours, then, you know, I don't know. on the outside, she's probably not very happy that I'm talking about it. Yeah, okay. all right. <laughs> Any other questions or comments or points anyone wants to make? I guess not. Okay, thanks so much, guys, for joining us. Um, should, we, should we try for another one a month's time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll see. Fine, we'll see what happens. It seems, I think so we don't get together. I think a lot less people take the food, so the sponsoring is not as... Uh, the shul's also happy to put some money towards it, and this time, uh, as you said, Yossi sponsored it, so the shul didn't even have to put any money towards it. We'll see what happens. But yeah, we'll be in touch. Okay, so I'll, I'll be in touch via the WhatsApp group. More regularly? Pardon? Maybe, maybe do it every, every fortnight. Uh, maybe not, not every, every fortnight with food, but maybe... Every yeah, sure. And then every, every okay. Food. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Yeah, if, I mean, again... You guys discuss amongst each other. If you know, if you prefer every fortnight, I'm happy to do every fortnight. I'm, I, there's no issue. I can do it every fortnight. I only said once a month because I thought there wouldn't be a sort of a, a demand. But if there's a demand, absolutely, we'll do it once a fortnight. It's between now and mid February. So, uh... Rabbi, Rabbi, we'll get we'll get the chayim sent out to everybody. Yeah, we'll do it like we. I showed. I told you I will do it next time. All right, we'll figure it out. You gotta do Ed's food next time. Yeah, we can do social well. We just need the lachaim. Okay. All right. Oh, I get it. Okay, we'll make it for your daughter, definitely. We'll all bring out our own lachaims. No problem. Mazel tov to you. Thanks, guys, for joining me. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.